So as a parent, one of the things that I've often thought is that a lot of the challenges that we experience or that I'm experiencing or as I'm interacting with my kiddo, it, they almost seem invisible. There, there's no clear cut thing I can see or say or point to that helps to make it clear. And that's been a source of frustration. And then many times I end up st stuck in this cycle uh, of not really understanding what's going on and being frustrated over something, my kiddo's frustrated over something, and I don't know what's going on. And then in interacting with the school too, they can be sending me questions or raising concerns over things, but we feel like we just don't have the answer. They're looking to me for an answer. I'm looking to them for an answer. And we're like, what is actually happening here? So in a training that I took through PESI with Dr. Ellert, she had an amazing story that helped to clarify this so well. So I asked her to come on here and to share with us to help clarify what can be going on in those instances. Where is the disconnect and what can we do about it? So Dr. Ellert, thank you for being here today. Can you start with a, a quick little introduction of yourself? Sure. Um, Dr. Laura Ellert and I live in Minnesota. I have a private practice in a suburb of Minneapolis. And I've been working with kids and families since the mid 80s when I graduated with my undergrad degree and then went on to get my doctorate degree and finished that in 1998. Um, and the specialty or the area that I like to focus on in my practice are those kids who are misunderstood, misperceived, and often come with behavior challenges, which is what gets them referred to outpatient therapy or special services in school and so on. Um, and my interest in that group of kids really comes from that perception of being misunderstood. Um, having my own kids, I, also kind of confirmed all of those different things that I started wondering about with the kids I was working with. And so I now travel with PESI when COVID ends and um, teach this seminar, trying to help parents, mental health people and school people really understand etiology of behavior rather than trying to just change the behavior, trying to really understand where does it come from? What's it purpose, if you will, and how do we solve the problems that create that behavior um, in terms of helping kids to regulate, make better choices, and so on. So that's kind of my specialty area and how I came to work with PESI and how Veronica and I came to meet via a webinar about two or three months ago. Mm -hmm. It was literally one of the best and most transformative things that I've done and taken, and so I appreciate you well, so I appreciate, much. I appreciate that because... <laughs> That's always good, right? That's why I show up. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. And I was thinking like, if I had a short phrase to describe it, I might describe it as having made the invisible visible. Um, oh, I because, like that. Yeah, that was just really, really helpful. So in that training, one of the stories that you shared was uh, a story about, who were the names that, again? Sally and Johnny. Sally and Johnny. Can you please just walk us through that so other people can have that same like transformative experience that I experienced? Yes. Sally and Johnny are made up people, um, but sort of representative of the misperception that happens for us as adults trying to help kids, trying to structure kids, trying to hold them accountable, help them develop skills and so on. Um, and it's really that piece of it is really centered around how normal developmental models set us up to set kids up. And I know none of us intentionally set kids up to fail, but we do all the time set them up without recognizing what we're doing. And when that happens, of course, kids are frustrated. And then since we aren't aware of how we set them up, we just kind of think, we'll just do it, right? So, I came up with these two people as an example to try to walk people through sort of experientially, if you will, from a point of view of a child, what this might feel like. Um, Cause it's really my belief that kids will do successful behaviors when we provide them realistic expectations, structures, and they actually have the skills to do it. The problem is a lot of times the expectation is a mismatch with the skills they have. And to make it more complicated, kids with disorders like ADHD, um, 
it isn't always about they can't do it. It's about at this moment for whatever complicated set of circumstances, they can't do it. So it looks like a lot of times they can do it if they want to, and it looks willful. So I think Veronica, what you meant by making the invisible more visible is to send, I mean, my goal in all the things that I do is to sensitize us adults who are trying to help kids to what is their experience like. So Sally and Johnny are two kids in seventh grade and they both have what is known as a 504 plan, which is um, a document of accommodations. It's part of the Individuals with Disabilities Act that a lot of kids in school who have processing differences, behavior differences, and even medical differences or physical differences would access accommodations through a 504 plan. Um, so Johnny is a kid in seventh grade who has an executive skills disorder. And um, one of the things he's struggling with because a lot of kids with executive skills disorders in seventh grade are struggling with organizing and keeping track of their homework using a planner and so on. And so Johnny has a ton of missing homework. And Johnny happens to have a family that every day says, what do you got for homework, Johnny? And they wanna help him with his homework. And Johnny will say maybe one or two things, but then not the whole list. And so he's got a ton of missing homework. Parents are frustrated with Johnny. Why won't you tell us you had this? Well, he says, I didn't know. He's all kinds of excuses. Parents don't believe him. They're fighting all the time. They come to the 504 plan meeting um, with the people at school <clears throat> talking about accommodations, what would be helpful, so on. And the parents say, somebody please just tell us the list that Johnny has for homework and then he'll quit failing classes because we'll make sure he gets it done. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's a common request at a 504 meeting for kids in seventh grade who have executive skills challenges. And inevitably, someone at the meeting almost always, nothing's ever 100%, right? But almost always says some version of, well, Johnny's in seventh grade. He should be able to keep his own planner. And um, if you look at a developmental model of executive skills, if you look under grades six through eight and the executive skills developmental model that I use is um, one that is in the book, Executive Skills in Children and Adolescents. And I gave people a couple of bulleted examples, but one of them under grades six through eight is has a system for organizing homework. So it is based on a normal developmental expectation that this statement in these meetings comes from. He's in seventh grade, he should have this skill by now. I'll come back to Johnny in a minute. Um, Sally. Sally is also in seventh grade. Sally has a different disability than Johnny. She is struggling with paralysis. She has a spinal cord injury. She's paralyzed from the waist down. So one of her obvious accommodations is she has a wheelchair. Um, she also has desks that don't have the chairs attached so that she can use her wheelchair to sit at the desk. She has access to the elevator she has extra passing time and so on. Um, <clears throat> so what I challenge people to do in the seminar at this point, so I'm gonna challenge all of you who are listening, um, is to imagine for a moment, and this is hard because it's kind of a stretch, but that you believe, and it's based on science, that Sally could in fact walk if she wanted to. So there's scientific research or evidence that you have become aware of and you know, based on that scientific evidence that Sally could walk if she wanted to. Now, if that were actually true, do you agree that if we just encourage Sally to stay in her wheelchair for the rest of her life and not work on what she could be working on to eventually be able to walk and not be in her wheelchair, that we would be doing Sally a disservice so if it's actually true, she can walk if she wants to, and there's a rehab program or whatever, but we tell her, don't do that, just stay in your wheelchair. We would be doing her a disservice. Hopefully you're all saying, well, absolutely, we, we, that would be a disservice. She would be not reaching her full potential. We would wanna challenge her and help her do that and so on. Okay, so going forward, 
that's me. That's the information I have. That's what I believe. Sally could walk if she wants to. And I believe it in my bones. I'm not just being a smart aleck. I think it's really possible for her. And I am trying to encourage her as her teacher. You, as you listen to the story, get to really know the truth, which is she's got a spinal cord injury and she can't walk. <clears throat> so as you listen to what I'm describing me doing, what your job is right now is to know the real situation and how that might be feeling to Sally as I do these different things, which are well-intentioned and only in my opinion, in Sally's best interest. Um, okay, so I'm her teacher and I think she could walk if she wants to, but every day she comes to my class a little bit late because she has to go from right below my, she's got a first hour or the hour right before me, a classroom at the bottom of the stairs, which are right outside my doorway her class that she's in right before mine. And then she's got to go all the way to the other end of the school to the elevator to get up to the second floor and then come back. Hence why she has extra passing time. But my belief is if she was working on this walking program, she would be able to take the stairs. So I say things like that to her, you know, Sally, your life would be a lot easier if you'd get up and walk. And she gets sassy with me when I say things like this like, well, I can't, so shut up, or other sassy things that seventh graders are famous for coming up with when you frustrate them. Um, and my perception of her sassy responses are um, motivation problems. She just doesn't want to try. And she'd rather be sassy and defensive with me rather than even look at the possibilities of even trying. So I persist because I care about Sally. You know, Sally, Every day you're late. Every day you could be on time if you took the stairs. And one day she goes, what do you want me to do? Take the stairs with my wheelchair? Just roll it up the stairs. And well, I'm good, but I'm not that good. And she goes on and on making a scene in class. And I'm like, whatever. You could be on time. You choose not to work on it. Whatever. I'm frustrated. Then one day um, we're in the library and uh there's a book on the top shelf. She needs to do an assignment I've given the kids. And she asks me in her polite voice, which I don't hear very often these days because I keep challenging her about being on time for class and other things like that. And um, she goes, um, could you get that book for me from the top shelf, please? I can't reach it. And I look at her and I go, well, thank you for asking nicely, but I believe you could get it if you wanted to. So you can either get it or not. It's your choice. And her response to me is a lot of swear words. And she's in the library, remember? Um, a lot of swear words and a lot of other really choice phrases. And one of the things that she starts telling me is, fine, you blankety blank. I won't do your blankety blank assignment. It's stupid anyways, blah, blah, blah. And when I get enough, it's your fault. But she's yelling and disrupting the library. And I'm like, you either need to use a quiet voice in here or you need to leave. And so as she's on her way out of the library to go to the behavior room, she's yelling all kinds of really disrespectful things at me, at the school, at the world. She whips the middle finger out. Everyone in the library is looking at her on her way out. And I'm wondering what it's going to take to motivate Sally because I just don't understand. But in fact, she did get enough on her paper. She didn't hand it in. And she did, in fact, Tell everyone it was my fault because I wouldn't give her the materials she needed for the assignment. And I'm just wondering what it's going to take to help Sally take responsibility for her own choices and to motivate her and so on. So I'm, I decide maybe I'll try a different approach than just pointing out the error of her ways every day to her. And I think, okay, I'll, I'll go buy her her favorite candy bar whatever it is, I see her eating it every day in the lunchroom. So I think I'll get her that in supersize because what teenager doesn't want the supersize of their favorite candy bar. So I spend my own money on this giant candy bar and I'm thinking she's gonna be like, Ooh, yum. <laughs> okay, I'll work on it. So she comes to class and I go, here's, look what I bought you. If you just show me any, any kind of effort toward trying to work on this program called walking, you can have it. I'll just, just any effort, any time, anything, just one time you can have it. And then she looks at me with just 
anger eyes, you know, look, I'm talking about. And she says, oh my God, are you trying to kill me? Don't you know how addictive sugar is? And, and teenagers eat far too much sugar. And she was on and on and on about all the health risks of sugar. And am I trying to poison her? And she would never eat such crap. And, uh, and she's just making this scene in front of the class. And I'm just looking at her and I'm like, oh my God, Sally, I see you eating this every single day at lunch. I thought you would like this. And she goes, I don't know who you're looking at, lady. Clearly your glasses are the wrong prescription, but I would never eat such crap. So I'm thinking now, wow, not only is she like totally blaming everybody else for her failures in life, but she's a liar. And I'm wondering what it's going to take to motivate Sally. So I think, all right, I got to up the ante on holding her accountable. And this is actually, when I say this, and she's got a five before it would tr truly be breaking the law. So but I'm using it as an example anyways, because we do up the ante on kids. Um, so I think, all right, fine. You need to be on time for class every day like everybody else, or you're going to get a tardy like everybody else does. Oh, well, that lot turns into a big fight again. So the next day, what she does is she not only comes in late, like she did every day, but, but she used to come in every day and just sit down at her desk, right? Now, the next day, she comes in even later, Oh my God, you guys, I couldn't get here on time. You should have seen the line at the elevator. And she's got this whole big giant story about why she couldn't get to class on time and the class is laughing. And it goes on for like five minutes, disrupting the hour. And it's just a mess. So this just continues until eventually there's a 504 plan meeting scheduled. And I go to the meeting with the rest of her teachers and everybody's well aware of our conflict. Um, and someone says, so what's going on with you and Sally? Oh, I just don't know what's going to motivate her. She's just one that just blames everybody else. And she disrupts my class every day. And she's just a problem. She just doesn't want to work on stuff that I know she can do. And um, it goes on and people go, well, what makes you think she can walk? You know, like, what is that based on? And I look at them all and I go, well, she's more than 18 months old. She shouldn't be able to walk. Hopefully your response is what? But that is a scientific piece of knowledge, normal developmental model. When should children be able to walk? Sometime between nine and 18 months. And in 18 months, they'd already be getting the attention of the medical world of being delayed in that gross motor development. So my evidence is a normal developmental model of Sally. She's more than 18 months old. She should be able to walk. That is the same reasoning being used when someone says, well, Johnny's in seventh grade. He should be able to keep his own planner. The exact same reasoning. Um, and hopefully when I say it about Sally, you, you have a big emotional response of, oh my God, what are you thinking? That does not apply to Sally, which you're right. It doesn't. Um, and why doesn't it? because Sally has a medical condition called spinal cord injury that prevents her brain from communicating with her legs. Therefore, it is not a reasonable use of that developmental model of gross motor skills because she doesn't have normal development in the area of gross motor skills when it comes to her legs. Um, therefore, cannot be used to set expectations for her. It doesn't make sense. Um, so back to Johnny, he has an executive skills disorder, which I did not name any more specifically than that on purpose because ADHD is but one of many possible reasons someone could have executive skills challenges. And we tend to group them all into they have ADHD. Um, they could have a brain injury, they could have anxiety, they could have depression, they could have other learning differences and many, many other things. And so it's an executive skills impairment um, of, of whatever the list of possibilities that might include, but he, his area of difficulty is in the executive skills world. Um, therefore, because he has a documented disability in the area of executive functioning, we cannot automatically apply normal developmental models of executive functioning skills to Johnny but we do it all the time in a variety of different ways with kids who have different processing um, struggles. And so 
Johnny's in seventh grade, he should be able to keep his planner is based on this normal developmental model. And that is a setup for us and for Johnny when we fall into that trap. What we should be doing instead with those normal developmental models is, all right, based on this, these developmental models, whatever the skill is we're talking about, what we want to do is say, where is this kid functioning right now? So then we talk about, and we have the model in front of us of the, the executive skills developmental model. Um, what Johnny's doing is bringing his backpack to backpack to and from school every day with all of the contents of his locker. And when I, I say this in front of actual humans, there's a lot of nodding going on, meaning a lot of kids do this as a coping skill to have all their stuff with them all the time because otherwise inevitably they're going to forget it. So they, their locker's empty and everything's in their backpack. Their backpack weighs about hundred pounds. It's completely disorganized, full of crumpled up disorganized papers, often liquidified sandwiches in the bottom by the end of the school year, but that's Johnny. He's, so in this normal developmental model of executive skills, um, bringing things to and from school is a kindergarten to second grade skill. But Johnny can't find anything in his backpack. He does have his planner every day, but it's hardly ever written in. So that's kindergarten. If you look at the next level up, it's, you know, they are starting to be able to organize and participate in what do I need to do? So Johnny's way down in kindergarten to second grade in this skill of organizing his daily work. There's a lot of Johnnies in seventh grade who have kindergarten to second grade skills in the area of organization. But what makes it confusing for a lot of us is in some different areas of Johnny's life, he might be highly organized. So we think he's just choosing not to. I mean, it does get confusing. Um, so I like to default to they would do it if they can, which is something Ross Green says a lot in his program called Collaborative Proactive Solutions. Um, and I, I, I agree with them 100%. Children will do it if they can. They don't want to be the kid having the tantrums every day and all the other things that people are mad and frustrated and disappointed with them about. And so if we can come to things from that belief system and start utilizing these um, developmental models to help us sort of where are they functioning, it gives you some hints about what do I do to help this person. It helps us adjust our expectation. Um, and then we have to challenge the challenge within ourselves of, am I enabling, am I helping too much, which is a good thing to always be aware of because it's easy to overhelp. It's easy to underhelp. And you don't want to do either. And sometimes Johnny might be right on top of his stuff and other days he's totally not and everything in between. So it, you want to think of it as a mentoring. We're going to be a team. We're going to do this together. Figure it out. Do you want me to go on and talk about how to make an accommodation? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so with that idea, the accommodation would be how do we together work on this skill? And um, how do we get you through that developmental trajectory so that eventually it's as independent as it can be? And sometimes that independence means I'm using an accommodation, but I can utilize it on my own. So like for example, Sally's in her wheelchair, that's an accommodation, but she knows how to use it by herself. She doesn't need us to help her. She might need some help getting in and out of her chair, um, but during the day, she's completely independent in using it. So it's not that she no longer needs the accommodation, it's that her independence is achieved with the accommodation. And sometimes that's true with these learning and um, processing differences as well. So we need to ask kids, we often create accommodations and goals and other things, and we forget to ask kids, what would help you? Mm -hmm. um, and we guess good ideas often enough, but often enough they also are ideas the kids reject, and we often perceive that to be resistance. Well, maybe it isn't the right accommodation for them. Something else might be going on. We might have guessed wrong. So I always, you know, what do you think, kid? <laughs> that would help you. So Johnny is struggling with his homework, knowing what to do. What is the list? That's our challenge. What is the list of homework? Now, let's say we figure that out and we start getting the list home. He still doesn't get it done. It means we have other problems we have to solve, right? But we've solved that problem. Sometimes new ones get 
uncovered, as we saw, it, this is a multiple layered kind of process frequently. Um, but Johnny, what's going on with your planner? We need to get the list home to mom and dad. What's making that hard would be some version of the question. And here's the common answers I hear from kids when I ask them questions about their planner. Um, they forget, like maybe teachers are writing it on the board in front, but they just forget to do it every day because the bell rings and all they can think about is or see my friends in the hall or whatever it might be. Um, so I forget. Uh, another one that you hear a lot is it's hard to know what to write. I don't know where to find the information or I don't know what it is or it takes too long so I don't do it or it's frustrating so I don't do it or sometimes kids feel like if I'm writing in my planner no one else is and so I look dumb socially so they'll say something like well having a planner is for dorks so that's a social um confidence or a social, I don't want to stand out in, in a weird way to my peers. Um, and then another one I will often throw out there because if it's happening and they might not offer this one. Um, and that is if I write all the homework I have in my planner, then my parents will make me actually complete it at home and I don't want to take the time to do it. Um, but in those examples, what they need from us is very different. Like if I forget, I need a reminder. If I get frustrated with the amount of time it takes, I need some help problem solving how to make this process less frustrating. If it's, I don't want to spend that time at home doing my homework, we got to talk about that and what's upsetting to that person. If it's social, we shouldn't just tell them it doesn't matter. I mean, would any of us, like if I said, what you have to do every day to get through school successfully is pick your nose and eat the boogers in front of everyone. I know you would never have that happen, but let's say it was, <laughs> right? Would you do it? Or would you be like, no, no, hey, I'm not doing that in front of my friends. I don't no. care what you do. I'm not picking my nose and eating the boogers in front of my friends. It's just not going to happen. Um, and then what I think is, well, you don't really want to solve this problem then, do you? Is that right? Or is that about social embarrassment? So we end up without realizing it, invalidating kids and their experience of what's going on around them and within them. And the minute we do it, they are less willing to tell us what's going on. And then we get a lot of, I don't know, and shut up and you're stupid and all the other stuff. Um, my hope is when I was telling the story about Sally, that you were maybe really in her corner, like, yeah, you go girl. Like, oh, she's really out of line. Um, not that you're endorsing the disrespect that she was giving me, but you're endorsing that she's protecting herself. You're saying, yeah, you know, that Dr. Ellert, she's wrong. And um, you are telling her she's wrong and Dr. Ellert's not listening to you. And that's what you are in her court about. Um, it, it, ex it helps you really appreciate that disrespectful behavior that she's having and its purpose. So we need to take that time to understand what's going on with kids. Um, what's the reason? And we forget to ask them that. And they're very good at making it look willful. They're very good at making it look like I'm just enjoying torturing you. So what are you going to do about it? And that is a self-protective behavior called saving face. I don't want to look foolish. I don't want to feel dumb. I don't want to be put down. Um, and those behaviors are not going to go away until we stop making them necessary to self-protect. If that makes sense. And it's complicated because the systems we work in are broken. Kids are complicated. And like you started out saying, Veronica, these are invisible kinds of challenges for kids. And they sometimes don't know either. Like they're puzzled with us. Like, I don't know why I can't do it. I just can't. And they sometimes are just as hard on themselves about that as we are. Right. Only I'm guessing they have a tendency to not verbalize that. It's a, that's the internal journey for them too. Or they'll even say, I'm just stupid. Mm. I don't have any friends. Everybody hates me. I mean, they do say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Good point. There is so much that you just unpacked here and, and so much more that you offer when you were sharing more inside of that program. And um, I'm going to ask you to share about how people can 
interact more with you in just a moment. I think one of the big values that I took away from, I mean, everything that you just shared, and then this idea that when we understand how the kid is perceiving the world, then we can really meet them where they're at and, and really help. So, and that's the big takeaway that I had from, from the training program that you put together. And um, you share so much more about that. <laughs> so like, I just encourage people to like reach out to you more or to, to sign this up. So can you tell us then how people can, can accomplish that? What can they know? What do they need to know? Um, well, PESI, P-E-S-I, um, they have recorded my seminar and there's two they're both largely the same information, but one is more catered to school settings and one is more catered to home and school settings, um, but largely the same information. And so they're both called self-regulation and in children and adolescents classroom or just challenging behaviors. So if you look up my name, Dr. Laura Ellert under the PESI website, you will find both of those and you can watch those, um, purchase that through PESI and watch it on your own. Or um, there are webinars far fewer than there used to be. Before COVID, I traveled um, twice a month at, to different locations around the country and gave the seminars. And then they would record them once in a while and also provide a live webinar for those who couldn't travel to wherever the location was. Um, but they do still have the um, seminar available to purchase as a I'm going to watch it as a recorded webinar um, <clears throat> through PESI. And then I'll give you my, uh, the link to my website where they can get my contact information and other things like that if they have um, need or want to contact me directly. Okay. Yeah. What is your website? And then um, that's kind of your training portion. And then tell us a little bit about your, what services you offer in general. Um, I do psychotherapy and um, a lot with parents and kids together, teamwork, right? Helping everybody sort of understand how does this kid's brain work and um, what can I do as a parent to set them up for success? And it has a lot to do with adjusting expectations and so on. Um, but so it's in that vein of what's going on, doing some problem solving, and then um, coming up with how are we going to work on this together kind of a thing. Um, so a lot of psychotherapy, I do in, you know, a diagnostic interview assessment, and I have some checklists in terms of assessment kinds of things, but a full psychological or neuropsychological assessment, I refer that out to others. Um, <clears throat> but what I can do as a first step is really look at what's going on have some really educated sort of questions for those assessments so that they can cater those instruments that they use to really <clears throat> tease out what's going on with kids and how they're processing the world. Mm -hmm. So what is the website address? Well, I wish I knew it by heart, but I'm going to look it up for you because I, it's just a Google website. <laughs> so it's, um, if you look my name up, Laura, Dr. Laura Ellert, you get to it, but it starts with sites.google.com um, backslash site dax backslash and then Laura, the letter S alert. Um, if you just do that, you'll find me. If you just Google my name, that's how I just did it. Okay. Um, one of these so, days I'm gonna get a website that's easier, but Google's free <laughs> so, and it's working so far for me. Yeah, absolutely. So Google Dr. Laura, E-H-L-E-R-T, right? Correct. And um, I'll link that down below as well. So okay. thank you so much for one, taking the time to understand this all, two, sharing and instructing others uh, because the impact I think is so huge. And I'm sure you have a million different stories about how people have been impacted and shifted their interaction with their kids because it's, it's to me, it seems pretty clear how we, from what you just described, kind of the misunderstandings that are happening on all sides on a regular yeah. basis. And to know that there's a path to help is huge. So you've pointed yeah. out a bunch for us already. And um, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share. <laughs> I appreciate it. My pleasure and encouraging everybody to follow up with you.